Well, a very, very good morning, St. Matthew's family. We're going to start by singing together two songs, so please stand as we sing that our God is for us. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night We will walk the valley with you by our side You will go before us, you will lead the way We have found a refuge, only you can say Sing with joy now, our God is for us The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake. Cheer me on with your never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Neither height nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Neither height nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us. strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Just to 
very, very warm welcome to our service today. We are excited for the day ahead as we join together in worshiping our God in this service, but also as we have our AVM after the service together. Now, Shane was down to preach, uh, to, to lead the service today, but I got a message in the middle of the night. <laughs> His wife, Alex, is in labor. So we will be holding them up in prayer. Um, I'm going to do that right now. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for our brother Shane and our sister Alex. We thank you that you have carried them through this pregnancy to this point. And we pray now during this labor um, for all those involved, for the, the midwife and the doula and for Shane as he supports Alex and for Alex, during this labor, that you would be with all of them. We pray that we would soon hear the joyful news of baby Philander's arrival. We commit them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul addressed a, a church family, and he encouraged them to live God-glorifying lives. Um, listen out to the similarities. If you've been with us in our 1 Peter series, there are big similarities between what Paul says here and what Peter has been saying in the last few weeks. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Following on from those verses, Paul goes on to flesh out what this 
submission looks like in a marriage, which is what Peter is doing in the passage we're going to be looking at later today. The way we live matters. The way we live in all spheres of our lives as Christians matters, including in our marriages. We want to live lives that bring glory to God. Well, before we sing again, let me pray. Heavenly Father, again, we commit ourselves to you this morning. We pray that every aspect of this service would be greatly glorifying to you. We pray that as we sing and pray and hear from your word, that you would thrill our hearts with the reminder of who we are because of Jesus. We are a family united together. We have been saved in the most amazing way. And we have been given a mission to tell all the world of Jesus. May our lives be lives that declare your praises. You, the one who has called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand together and sing again. Consider Christ. Consider Christ, the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me. Though he was pure, a lamb without a blemish, he took my sins and nailed them to
wonderful. If you've joined us since we started, a very, very warm welcome to you. It is wonderful to see such a, a full auditorium. Uh, we're thankful for all of you who have registered to come to the service, and we are so thankful that so many of you are wanting to stay for our AVM after the service. Um, if you are just visiting and you don't know about our AVM, we're having a, a general meeting after this service, but it really is going to be a time of celebration, looking back at what God has done, looking ahead, trusting ourselves to God for the work ahead of us. So we encourage all of you to stay, um, whether you're a member or not, a visitor, you've come with someone else today, um, you are welcome to stay. And after that, that's going to be starting at 10 o'clock, so very soon after our service. And then after the, the AVM, we're going to be having a picnic lunch together uh, in the Reach Cafe Gardens. If you um, have bought a picnic, that's a wonderful thing. We're not going to be doing a bring and share just during COVID days, so uh, enjoy your own picnic. If you haven't bought a picnic, Reach Cafe is open, and you can also... Uh, get something off their wonderful menu to enjoy for that lunch. Another thing just happening in our, our family life together, a few people from St. Matthews are going to be going to Betty's Bay to Harold Porter Nature Reserve next uh, Saturday. If you would like to find out more about that, you can speak to uh, Chantel or Adele, I think, um, about those details. And then one final thing, next Sunday at all of our services, we are going to be having communion together, the Lord's Supper. And so we just want to forewarn you and encourage you to bring your own bread and grape juice so that we can celebrate that um, remembrance of what Jesus has done and all that it means for us. So I'm going to lead us again in a time of prayer. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, there are, again, so many things for us to give thanks to you for. Help us never to forget to thank you. Make us a people who are thankful for you, for who you are, for what you've done for us through our Lord Jesus, for your Spirit's continued work in our lives, that we'd be thankful for all of the blessings that you give us, and help us to use those blessings to be a blessing to others. Heavenly Father, we pray increasingly for uh, loving relationships in this family, that we would know people in this church family deeply, that we'd be sharing life together, that we'd be caring for one another and serving together and on mission together. We pray that you would grow that unity and that you would help us to swiftly deal with any things that may cause division in a gentle and a loving way because we know that that brings glory to you. But our Father in heaven, we know that we often fall short in our day-to-day -day lives. We don't live in a way that pleases you. With our thoughts, our words, and our actions, we, we sin against you. And our sin is a problem. But we are so thankful that in your word you tell us that if we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And we know that is true because on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Thank you for the finished work of Jesus who has paid for our sins. Make us to be a people who are daily confessing our sins to you, not to grovel in our guilt, but rather to rejoice in the freedom that is ours because of Jesus. Heavenly Father, there are many things happening in the life of this family uh, that we would love to bring to you in prayer. We pray for um, Carrie and Ati um, and Heidi Kavanagh and Ferdy, who are all um, in the midst of medical um, difficulties. We commit them to you, and we pray that you would heal them. We pray that through this time that they would fix their eyes on you, and we pray that for us as their spiritual family that we would surround them in love and support in many different ways. We pray too for others known to us who are going through difficult times, and just in the quietness of your own heart, just commit those people to the Lord now.
Again, Father, we pray for the imminent arrival of baby Philander. May you have your hands um, on them today in a, a tangible way and may they experience the joy of a baby being born into a church family as we love and rejoice and celebrate and support them in many ways over the days and weeks and months and years that lie ahead. Finally, we pray for our AVM happening after the service, that every aspect of that meeting would be to the praise of your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, it's time for Adele to give the children's talk. Good morning, everybody. Now, over Easter, we have taken a little break from our series in 1 Peter. So I think I need to remind you and help you remember the, ch the uh, memory verse that we have learned. So let me remind you. Live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. 1 Peter 2 verse 12. Now, I need you to say it with me. So there's this black line down the middle of our hall. Everybody on this side is going to do the actions. Everybody on this side is going to say the words. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three. Live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. 1 Peter 2 verse 12. Now, we're going to swap. So you guys do the actions, and you guys say the words. Are we ready? One, two, three. Live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. 1 Peter 2 verse 12. Well done. Now, in the passage that we are looking at today, it comes just a little bit after Peter has told us this memory verse. And today's passage talks all about marriage. Now, some marriages might look like this. Oh, it's getting quite late. Okay, I'm going to bed. Uh, okay, I just got an email from my boss. I've got to go away for a few days. I'm, I've got to leave at five o'clock. I'll see you when I'm back. Okay, again. Other marriages might look like this. I took the kids. <laughs> I took the kids to the library today. Oh, cool. Yeah, they, they love the books that we got. Uh, have they read any of them yet? Um, I read a few, but we've got lots more to read. Listen, 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 oh, it's our wait. song. This song. Some may look like this. Adele, I'm angry. Could you bring me some food? I've had enough of your laziness. I'm not making you food. I'm going to bed. You sleep on the couch. Perhaps some marriages may look like this.
Honey, I'm home. Oh, what's that smell? Man, I have had such a hectic day. I was making your favorite food for supper, and then someone put the plug in the basin. It flooded. I've only just finished cleaning it up, and everything burns. I don't know what we're going to eat. It's okay, gorgeous. Uh, should I shoot for the shop and just get something for supper? Thanks. Do you, do you need anything else while I'm out? No, just something for supper. Okay. Thank you. Peter talks about marriage in the passage that we're looking at today. He tells us how a husband and a wife should respond and act towards each other. And he tells us this because the world is watching our marriages. The world sees our marriages. The world sees how we act and how we respond. The world sees the way we are kind and gentle towards each other, or if we are bitter and nasty. The world sees our marriages. And as the world watches our marriages, they should glorify God. In our marriages, we should be missionaries. As the world watches the good deeds that we do, and as we live with, as a husband and wife, the world should see our good deeds and glorify God. Now, children, I'm sure that none of you are married. <laughs> but the best thing that you can do is to pray for those who are married. Pray for all the people in our church family who are married. Pray that as the world watches our marriages, they would glorify God. Let's pray now. Father, we do thank you for marriages. We thank you especially for the marriages here at St. Matthew's. We pray, Lord, that you would be protecting and God in those marriages. Help every person in a marriage to be loving and kind and gentle towards their spouse. So that as the world watches our marriages, they would glorify God. We pray, Lord, that you would help all of us to have a concern for marriages, whether we are young or old or married or single. We pray that you would help all of us to have a desire to seek marriages, being such that they glorify God. And help us to help each other in this, we pray. Amen. I'm not sure if it's now that we need to tell the pastor that it's unconstitutional to dance in the church. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> And I forgot, it is time for the children who are eight years old and under to go to children's church. So if you are eight years old and under and you want to go to children's church, your parent can take you down the passage and sign you in there. We're going to sing again. It's a song about Christ as our example of service. He came to serve us, not to be served. And in the same way, we serve one another. Won't you stand, please? Let's sing together. From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veil, not to be served, but to serve, and gave your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant. Calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. There in the garden of tears, my heavy load. He chose to bear His heart with sorrow was torn Yet not my will But yours he said This is our God The servant king He calls us now to fall
Come see his hands and his feet The scars that speak of sacrifice Hands that flung stars into space To cruel males surrender This is our God servant king he calls us now to follow him to bring our life as a daily offering of worship to the servant king so let us learn how to Let me change hats again. <laughs> if you would open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. As I sometimes say, if you are reading along on a phone or a tablet, I really do encourage you to put it on flight mode um, so we can focus on God, hearing God speak to us together without notifications coming and, and stealing our attention. So let's give our attention to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as is with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we can be here today with the great privilege of hearing you speak. You continue to speak to us today through the words of your Bible. We pray that your spirit would take these truths and would work them deep into us shaping us and fashioning us into the likeness of Christ. I pray that you would give all of us receptive hearts and open ears, that we might hear what you have to say and how this impacts our lives here in Tableview. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How does our world view marriage? Cartoons like Andy Cap show Flo beating Andy up for his continual drunkenness, Al Bundy in the, in the series Married with Children, 
hates his life and hates his wife. Society has a pretty low view of marriage. And the divorce rates bear witness to this. Just watch this video for a different perspective. I don't count it a burden, whatever, to have to care for her. I, I need to do everything. From the moment she gets up to the moment she goes to bed, I do absolutely everything. Um, clean her teeth, uh, shower, dress, everything. And, um, but it's, it's a privilege. I count it a great privilege to, to care for this one that I've loved all of these years and continue to love. This is the year when we'll celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. Our stories have been a, a lovely story. I first saw her when she was eight years old and her brother became my best friend. And we grew up together and as we grew up, yeah, she was there. And I knew that she used to stare at me when I was playing footy with, my, with her brother and uh, our another friend and when we used to ride bikes and she kept staring at me, but I wasn't interested. I was 17, she was 16. I saw her dolled up, dressed up, and she had an A-line dress on and boom, it was gone. I was, uh, she was the one for me then, absolutely. <laughs> when we first started uh, dating, I used to ride my bike from where I lived to where she was and that was about five kilometres on a Saturday afternoon because it was the only chance we had to get together. And uh, it was hair wash day for her and she used a special cream in her hair for a shampoo. And I can still smell it, because that smell was so particular, so nice. It was just absolutely special. We had a bike. I used to ride everywhere on my bike, and then Glad had a bike as well, and we put a, a baby chair on the front of her bike, and so we carried our babies around on the bike with her as well. So, yeah, bike's been part of our lives, and I guess that has something to do with us now. Around about 2004-05, I began to notice um, that there were things going wrong. She was finally diagnosed with uh, the horrible disease of Alzheimer's. Having lived overseas, I knew that with a bike you can do lots of things. So I had a bike made, a bike chair made. We take it to the beach and ride along beside the beach. And as we do that, we see lots of people. A lot of people come talk to us because it's a, a unique thing. Nobody else has got a bike chair quite like that one. I am determined to care for her every need, every need. You see, God has loved us so unconditionally. And I understand that God has put his love in my heart. And because I realize how much God has loved me, that's how I too can love my lovely wife. She has done so much for me over all of these years. Now she can't, but I can, and I can return her love. Uh, and it's a love that, uh, well, to me, means I can do everything for her. She's my princess, I'm her William, and I wouldn't <laughs> have it any other way. Would you have it any other way? No, uh, no. no not at all. We love each other. What's a better picture? What type of marriage would you rather have? Al Bundy's or Bill and Glad's? Which of these types of marriage do you think is more glorifying to God? Bill and Glad's marriage is not just a sweet, soppy picture of marriage. It's a God-glorifying marriage. And the passage that we're looking at this morning is all about marriage, but it's also all about mission. A few weeks ago, we saw that our mission as the church, according to 1 Peter 2 verse 12, is to live good lives for God's glory. We are all missionaries, and our marriages fall under God's mission strategy. We need to hold on to the fact that we as the church are God's plan A to reach the world, and he doesn't have a plan B. And relationships within the church are vital for God's mission strategy. And that means that if you're a Christian here today, then you are a missionary. For the large majority of us, our long-term missional activity or missionary activity will be focused right here on the west coast of Cape Town 
at your place of work, in your neighborhood, in your home. Peter started a new section in 2 verse 11. Just cast your eyes there. He says, Dear friends, 2 verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. As we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, our King, we are to live good lives for God's glory. And living these good lives has a massive impact on our relationships. And it should significantly change the way that we view marriage. In today's passage, Peter has specific instructions for wives and husbands, and all of this falls under the umbrella of living good lives for God's glory. Wives... Does the way that you relate to your husband glorify God? As society listens to the way you speak about your husband, does it lead them to glorify God? Husbands, do you honor your wife in every way? Do you see your wife as a precious gift from God? Do you treat her with all respect so that God will be glorified through you? See, the way we relate to our spouses is a missionary activity. It's a declaration to the unbelieving world that our God is glorious. Is your marriage living up to that goal? If you have, if you have an unbelieving husband or wife, your greatest desire should be that he or she comes to know and love Jesus. And your whole life should be a signboard pointing them to Jesus. As Christian couples, the way that we live together or the way we speak of one another in private and in public should be a signboard pointing the world around us to Jesus. If you're unmarried here today, this passage speaks to you too. It may be training you to relate to your future husband or wife in a godly way. Or perhaps you are blessed with the gift of singleness. And yes, it's a gift. God's word speaks as highly of singleness as it does of marriage, sometimes even more highly. So if you're single, this passage will help you as a part of this family to speak to the married people you know about their marriages, challenging them, encouraging them, urging them to use their marriages as a tool for God's glory. Unfortunately, I know too many Christian married people who speak terribly about their husbands or wives. The world's picture of marriage is warped. And unfortunately, our marriages in the church are sometimes traced on that warped picture we are called and challenged to trace our lives, our whole lives, even our married lives, on the example that Jesus has left us. So I pray that we'll leave here massively challenged and greatly motivated to, to view marriage as a wonderful gift from God, just one of the gifts that he wants us to use for his glory. Our marriages are a missionary tool. So let's have a look what Peter says to missionary wives. Have a look at verse 1. Verse 1, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Wives, in the same way, submit. In the same way, that's referring back to something that's come before. And the previous section was all about following Jesus' example of submission and honor so that God will be glorified. You see, submissive wives are God-glorifying wives. I remember going to a wedding about a month before my own wedding, and at the reception table later in that evening, a few of the young ladies who were sitting there uh, were saying, I could never make those promises that I heard at that ceremony to, to submit to a man. 
A few years ago, I was asked to conduct a wedding, and in the week leading up to the wedding, I got an email from the couple, and they asked me, please, can you just take that word submit out of the vows? I needed to explain to them that submission is a beautiful thing. Submission is not he goes out to work and she does all the work at home. Submission is not a belittling thing. Submission has to do with your attitude and your actions towards your husband. Just listen to this wonderful description of a submissive wife from Carolyn Mahaney. A submissive wife, far from being the weak-willed woman our culture portrays, is actually a model of inner strength. By God's grace, she has conquered the sinful desires within her own heart. It is actually weakness on display when a wife is not submissive. She's only caving in to her natural inclination to usurp authority and demand her own way. That doesn't take any effort at all. It's quite a quote, isn't it? See, most people in our world have a completely warped view of what submission in marriage means. A submissive wife is a beautiful wife. Beautiful to her husband. Beautiful to the watching world. Beautiful to God. And this life of submission is traced on the life of Jesus. Just look back to chapter 2 again, to verse 21. 2 verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Jesus was the ultimate example of submission, even in the face of suffering. A submissive wife is a Christ-like wife. In submission, a Christian wife presents herself before the watching world as a person whose life is being traced on the life of Jesus. Now Peter is speaking particularly to Christian wives who have unbelieving husbands. Just look what he says in verse 1 again. 3 verse 1, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the good news about Jesus, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. There are many examples of where Christian wives have been instrumental in leading their husbands to Jesus without a word. The Christian wife has many options. She could leave little Christian notes scribbled in his sock drawer for him to find and read. She could nag him to just come from time to time to church services. She could point out all the things that he's doing wrong and say, if you just came to Jesus, he would fix all that. Or she could live such a good life alongside her unbelieving husband Loving him, serving him, submitting to his leadership, even if he's not treating her as he should. And in all of that, pointing him to Jesus. Now at this point, wives might be thinking, ah, but my husband is lazy and inconsiderate. All my husband ever does is watch sport. My husband is irresponsible with the finances. I have a husband who never disciplines our children he doesn't lead our family well. He's not a Christian. None of those excuses are valid. Unless a moral issue is at stake, wives, Christian wives are obliged by Scripture to submit to their husbands. And submitting to him is a glorious picture of the gospel. A, submiss a submissive wife is a beautiful wife. Beautiful to her husband, beautiful to the world around her, beautiful to God. And look how verse 3 continues. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. What does our world want us to believe about beauty? What do magazines tell us about beauty? You need to be hot, sexy, 
trendy, successful, or you won't be valued. I think it would probably be quite a scary exercise to compare how much time and money some Christian women spend on things that make them look outwardly beautiful, gym, spa, treatments, health food, glamour magazines, new clothes. You compare that to how much time and energy you spend on feeding your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. What does God value more? The end of verse 4 makes it clear. The amount you invest on your soul is of great worth in God's sight. I would much rather have a wife who is beautiful in God's eyes than a wife who turns every head in the mall but has little concern for God. Adele is outwardly beautiful. But something may happen one day that takes that outer beauty away. But Adele has an inner beauty that will never fade. Thank you, Jesus. It's going back quickly to verse 3. In verse 3, Peter is not forbidding elaborate hairstyles. He's not outlawing jewelry and nice clothes, but he's warning against an unhealthy preoccupation with your personal appearance. I think we need to hear this warning. I have three beautiful daughters God tells me in his word that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. I need to teach them that inner beauty is much more valuable than outer beauty. Inner beauty shows in a much greater way what it means to be fearfully and wonderfully made. It's far easier to be outwardly attractive. Much easier than being inwardly beautiful. But it's this inner beauty that brings glory to God. I want my wife and daughters, more than anything else, to be glorifying to God as the Spirit of God works in them. Peter goes on to give an example from history. Look at verse 5. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. Hope in God is expressed in a wife honoring her husband as she submits. Do you catch that? Hope in God is expressed in honoring your husband, wives. If you're not a submissive wife, Peter is suggesting that perhaps your hope is not in God. And Peter spoke back in chapter 1, verse 3, about this living hope that is ours because of Jesus. It's a hope that is anchored in the past because Jesus rose. It's a hope that remains in the present because Jesus is alive. It's a hope that will be fulfilled in the future because Jesus is coming. And Peter is saying that if wives have their hope in God in the present, it will be shown by them submitting. Your submission is a thing of true beauty. And Peter goes on to speak about Sarah as an example of a beautiful woman. Genesis tells us that Abraham's wife, Sarah, was an outwardly beautiful woman. But Peter says that it was her submission that made her beautiful. And that's an inner beauty. Peter is saying, follow her example, because it is a sign that your hope is in God. Submission is a whole lot more important than many people think. It's a huge part of living a good life for God's glory. So let me ask you again. Is the way that you are relating to your husband God-glorifying? Think about the way you speak to others about your husband. Would those around you end up praising God more just because of the way you speak about your husband? Does the way you speak to your husband, in those moments when no one else can hear you, do those words bring glory to God? Is your husband being pointed to Jesus daily as he sees Jesus in you, as you submit to your husband, as a sign that your hope is in Jesus? 
Wives, you may have much repenting to do. The wonderful news of the gospel is that God, the Spirit, is at work in his children. He's the one who convicts of sin. He's the one who points us to Jesus' death on the cross where that sin was dealt with. And he is the one who enables change. And so he's the one who gets all the glory. A submissive wife is a beautiful wife, beautiful to her husband, beautiful to the watching world, and greatly glorifying to God. Now, Peter goes on to speak to husbands. He has much less to say, but it's equally hard-hitting. Just look at verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Husbands, be considerate. Literally, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, men, you will know that it is notoriously hard to understand women. (laughs) Women are wonderfully complex. This little video illustrates it well. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail out. See, you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't <laughs> try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can go on? We can work it out. Thanks. Um, woman, you are wonderfully complex. <laughs> That's the way God's made you. This wonderful complexity is a part of God's good design for woman. And Peter was married. He must have known how complex women are. But he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. James, that's going to mean hard work. We are going to have to work really hard to learn what it means to be considerate. Now, I grew up in a home where I was served. I really didn't have to do anything My mom pretty much did everything for me, which I loved because I'm a selfish sinner. But my mom did Adele a great disservice by not teaching me to be considerate when it came to packing away the dishes or picking up clothes or picking up pretty much anything that was left around. I didn't know how things got from the table to the kitchen. It just happened. As a husband... I've had to learn to be considerate to Adele. 17 years married, and I still have so much to learn. Why should I be considerate? What's my motivation to have a happy... uh, What is my motivation to be considerate? Is it just because I want a happy home or a a happy wife with less tension? Those things are great spin-offs, But my motivation for being considerate goes back again to 2 verse 12. 
I want to live such a good life with my wife so that God will be glorified. God is glorified as selfish David picks up his dishes and takes them to the kitchen. God is glorified as husbands use their words to build their wives up rather than break them down. God is glorified as husbands study their wives so that they will know how to live with them in an understanding way, knowing the things she loves, the things that make her safe, the things that show that you love her wonderful complexity. Tell her you love her. Ask her how she's feeling. Help out at home. Husbands, you need to study your wife. She is a precious gift from God to you. Learn how to treasure her. Now, how are these things glorifying to God? Look at the second half of verse 7 again. Treat your wives with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. Your wife is precious in God's sight. She is an heir, and therefore you are to respect her. Now, actually, this is a weak translation. Honor, or, or the word precious would be better. Treat your wife as extremely precious. A gift from God, not a tool to be used for your own gratification, but a precious gift. Husbands, do you know that treating your wives this way is greatly glorifying to God? Because it shows that the power of God is greater than the power of your own sinful nature. Husbands, how are you doing? If I asked your wives, what might they say? Husbands, you may need to repent. You may need to study your wife more closely, seeking to understand her more so that you can honor her appropriately. God will be glorified through this. Our marriages should be a great tool that we use to point the watching world to King Jesus, a tool that God uses in his mission strategy. See, our marriages should bring great glory to God. If you see me treating Adele in a way that you don't think is glorifying to God, it's your loving duty as my brother or sister and fellow missionary to come and tell me. But do it in love. Do it gently. Do it because you want God to be glorified. Perhaps it's just become a habit for you to speak badly of your spouse. You may even just do it in jest. But what picture is that giving to the world who's watching? Is the jesting going to lead your friend or your neighbor closer to Jesus? Imagine the impact it could have if you began to speak and act differently. It's the easiest thing in the world to break someone else down. But it brings no glory to God. It's incredibly hard to consistently speak well of someone to submit and honor those who are perhaps harsh or foolish. But as you submit, as you honor, it brings great glory to God. Is your marriage God-glorifying? Is your marriage a reflection of chapter 2, verse 12? That they may see your good deeds as you joyfully submit to your husband, as you shower your wife with love, as you give your wife a break by taking the kids as you step in to babysit so the young couple can have a night off, that they may see all of that and glorify God. After hearing God speak through his word, all of us probably have some soul searching to do. You may have some apologizing to do. Perhaps later today, it would be a wonderful opportunity to spend some time praying together with your spouse praying that your marriage might become a wonderful picture to the world of a good life lived for God's glory. If you aren't married, pray for the marriages at St. Matthew's. All of us should spend much time praying for the marriages in this family. If there's one thing that can destroy our unity, 
as a Christian family, it is marriage trouble. The devil hates submissive wives. So he'll do whatever he can to stop you submitting. He doesn't want God to be glorified through you. The devil hates husbands who honor their wives. So he'll do whatever he can to stop you treating your wife as the precious gift from God that she is. Because he doesn't want God to be glorified through you. But Jesus has given us an example that we might follow in his footsteps. And as we follow his steps, he's the one who gets the glory. And that's our goal. More than anything else in every aspect of our lives, may God be glorified. So in Matthew's family, we are missionaries. A part of the mission strategy is our marriages. But our marriages are just a part. They're not the whole of this community. This family is made up of singles and married people and old people and young people, people who are vastly different but who have been united together because of Jesus. And we have one common purpose. We want God to be glorified through us as we live among the unbelievers around us that they may see our good deeds and glorify God. Let's get stuck into this mission together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you that your word speaks very specifically into every aspect of our lives. We thank you for this passage that speaks into the area of marriage. We pray for the marriages here at St. Matthew's. We pray that as a family, we would be watching each other's backs because we love each other, because we want to see marriages flourish here, because that is glorifying to you. In areas where we need to repent, Father, we, we ask your forgiveness and we entrust ourselves to you, knowing that the blood of Jesus has covered our sins. But we pray now that by your Spirit, you would not just challenge us, but that your Spirit would do his work and change us. That our lives might be increasingly lived for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, we're going to sing one more time. O oh, great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. Would you stand, please? Great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin Help me now to live a life 
that's dependent on your grace. Keep my heart and guard my soul from the evils that I face. You are worthy to be praised with my every thought and need. Oh, great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. You are worthy to be praised with my every thought and God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. It's a joy that we can gather together like this, and it's a joy that we can continue to gather for our AVM, so please don't rush off. We'll be uh, back together in just a, a few minutes if you want to Grab a coffee at Reach Cafe or just stretch your legs. That's great, but don't, don't go too far away. We'll be back here at 10 o'clock. I just want to read a few verses from Ephesians 3 as we close. Now to him who is able to do super abundantly more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.